Welcome to implementing a true enterprise image management solution, sponsored by an educational grant from Sectra. I'm Mary Tierney, the Chief Content Officer of Health Imaging and TriMed Media Group, and the moderator for today's live webinar and question and answer session. University hospitals in Cleveland made do for years with separate packs for radiology, cardiology, and other image-intensive clinical departments. Now, the integrated health system, with 18 hospitals and 40 clinics, is a good way through implementing a true enterprise image management solution, a vendor-neutral archive, which has been a huge goldmine for patient care. Their goal of one patient, one record has come true, facilitating excellent patient care, simplifying workflow, and reducing costs. Today we'll hear from the project leads at University Hospitals that include Dr. Jeffrey Sunshine, who is the Vice Chairman, Department of Radiology at UH Case Medical Center, and the CMIO of University Hospitals, and Beverly Recipko, who's the Director of Radiology Informatics at University Hospitals. At the end of the webinar, we will have a 15-minute question-answer session. If you would like to ask a question of the team, please type it into the Ask a Question box on your console and hit Submit. Dr. Sunshine, let's start with your definition of a true enterprise image management solution. So enterprise image management is a strategy and then a set of tools to have a unified approach to how we're going to capture our images, store them, distribute them on demand, and maintain them uh, going into the future. So it's a enterprise-wide, meaning wherever we touch images or patients, how are we going to, to have a unified approach to that? We have uh, enabled into the archiving system uh, that represents an unified image management for the enterprise, uh, not only radiology, but cardiology. That's where we are. We are distributing that unified view to our physician portal and are advancing the distribution into the EMRs. So it's already there in part. We're making sure it's complete and accessible in the most simple way possible. So that's where we are. Where we're going is to complete that path of simplified distribution to the EMRs regardless of the source system. And then secondly, we're going to add further ologies uh, as appropriate, and we're considering ophthalmology, dermatology, gastroenterology. Uh, simplicity of management, taking advantage of core technical abilities, vendor solutions, and reducing the number of different people we would have to have to manage each different solution. Uh, so that was a part of it. The other was to enable uh, things like patient portals, physician portals, and EMRs to have singular access to images uh, on demand, re regardless of the primary source. We wanted to move in this direction because imaging occurs in multiple departments and it's siloed. So if I'm in cardiology and I need to see, but I still need to see a radiology study, I have to log into a separate system. I have to, you know, a different user interface. So there was multiple reasons that it really drove us to be able to image enable our EMRs, physician portal, soon to be patient portal, and to provide more than just radiology imaging, but also expand to the other imaging areas like cardiology, dermatology, ophthalmology. And also what we found during the discovery phase was the, the need for this single modalities sitting in ICUs, sitting in physician offices, and those images are just being stored and they're not available so they don't have that portability that having them on a centralized enterprise image management system and what I refer to it as an EMR for images because that's really what it is. It's bringing all your imaging into a single database so regardless of where those images are obtained, they are available for anyone to see. So regardless of where a patient goes to, that information is available to our clinicians, which provides them with a, a better patient-centric view of that patient and what they have going on. And there's benefits as far as, you know, reduced radiation exposure. So the portability and the, avail and the access to these records is really streamlined with, with the system. 
my vision was a patient-centric image record, ability to, to view any image from a single viewer via the EMR, and it helps also to enable image sharing. The other benefit of going with Sectros, part of their product is called Connectivity Hub, and we're the first in the United States to utilize this. Within that, their Connectivity Hub, they have records from all the different systems or files, so they got a file of all the patients from the different systems, and then based on specific rules, they will link the patients within their connectivity hub. So behind the scenes in the database, the records are getting linked. Um, so when the, the user looks at the patient record, they see a single patient record, which is huge. Historically, if a, if a radiologist or a physician looked at my records, they would have to click on me three separate times and not be able to compare my exams. Well, with, with this, they can... They only see my name once, they click on it, and they see an all-inclusive list of my exams, which I think is a huge gold mine for, for patient care. You hear a lot about, like, you know, EMRs wanting to be one patient, one record, and we truly are one patient, one record for images. So if radiology as a rough number represents 80 to 85 percent of all current clinical imaging compared to cardiology and then all the other ologies. Pathology in all the image data would dwarf radiology, so scalability is a, is a distinguishing concern in this space, especially if pathology is on the roadmap. Vendor Neutral Archive is a way to manage what has become a cyclical path of always having to migrate every time you do a platform change on any one system and to have a way to change out your archive hardware, which like many things in the computer change every few years, without having to incur a huge cost or even a significant cost just to move the images. So by having a vendor neutral layer, we expect to be able to, to do that in a much more cost-effective way, manage the ongoing changes in vendor space and, and archive technology. So the, the vendor neutral archive is really just, and, and, and when I first started getting into this, I did, you know, you hear vendor neutral archive and you think of, you know, a centralized location for storage. And that's really what a, a vendor neutral archive is. So the data is in a standard format, you know, DICOM, but it's stored in a centralized location. You know, it's really the back-end piece to me what a vendor-neutral archive is. So all the data is going through there and it's stored there. But to me, the enterprise image management system is more of the ability to manage all your images and, and know where they are and be able to perform you know, route them to different places, to prefetch them to different systems. It just the naming, to me, you know, you hear vendor neutral archive, you think of a piece of hardware where the images are archived. It's really a middle piece of software database that knows everything about all your images from, from all your front-end applications. So you could have 20 different front-end image applications or devices, and they all filter through this enterprise image management system that creates this database that, that knows all about all these images and then can deliver them back um, as needed. I don't think there's such a thing as zero footprint. What it attempts to capture is the idea that you could have typically web-based access to images that had very little demand on the device that was showing you the image. So it, uh, the zero footprint is in the thing that's showing the end user, clinician, patient, physician. The image, all the work is done on the back end, and you're just using the display of that device, be that a, a personal computer or a set of monitors or a mobile tablet or handheld, that any of those, do, there's not, there's essentially no requirement in that machine. Everything's done on the back end. So we put out a request for a proposal to, I think, uh, five or six, I think six vendors um, with our requirements that we wanted. And then we reviewed those. You know, we had demos, went through our due diligence. And it was important to have a UNIVIEWER, you know. So we, we just went through the requirements and then 
we narrowed it down to two, obviously, and then start looking at, you know, comparing and then selected our vendor. One of the big benefits was the development and roadmap of their product, that they had different functionality available, prefetching, routing. They gave us the tools in their product to empower us to continue as we expand and to do our own data migrations. So, you know, there was other vendors that didn't necessarily give you, didn't train you on how to utilize the product, the the software to empower you. You know, having that viewer that could be utilized for any image type. The big, the other big one was that they could deliver the images back in the native format. So that's important because, you know, different departments have different image file types, if you will, or formats. So you might have a an OCR or a, an image type that's specific for like ophthalmology. So sometimes when patients come back, they need those images back in that format in order for their systems to be able to process them again, where some vendors put a wrapper on them, but they could not deliver them back in the native format. So that was a you know, just in comparison, those were some of the, and then, you know, they have the disaster recovery and um, there was benefit that we already had their PAC system. So the migration was less painful to the VNA and it wasn't painful at all. Actually, there was no, we saw no impact in, in migrating our, all of our radiology studies from the last 13 years into the VNA. I think, you know, vendor selection is very important. There's uh, more mature vendors in any space uh, that uh, tend to have wide success. There's different price points. There's people trying to get into the business. I think don't assume that certain somewhat technical phrases like enterprise image management or vendor neutral archive mean the same thing to any two parties. Make sure you have the conversation to define what those phrases mean. Uh, going forward. One is the success we had had with their original architecture in a very large-scale radiology-focused PACS domain um, and their ability to transition um, across a decade to continuously improve uh, that reliability and and deliverable. Uh, So some of that technology and those successes could be transferred to this domain. Uh, So I think that was uh, a piece of the puzzle. Uh, I think for us, uh, very reliable uptime and connectivity are critically important, and having uh, control over that by ourselves and through our vendor uh, was important. Having uh, the right roadmaps that look like we can take continuous advantage of developing technology and reduce cost even as the burden of image volume goes up, that, that's an important distinguishing factor. So now if you need to scale, um, you're not reproducing your touch points, you're just adding to them. And we map out in advance which nodes in such a system might have to expand at certain thresholds of growth um, so we can anticipate those and be prepared. So if you're managing in an individual silo, then each of those silos has a technical architecture that may be distinct. It has a different contract that controls, that defines who controls that. It has a different user group that's weighing in on what they would like. It has a different support group that has to work with that user group and come up with a unique solution that may only be slightly variant from what they're doing next door in a different ology and not even know that. And that's just not sustainable in a multi-fragmented pathway. So it unifies that entire landscape uh, in in a way that we can be practical about putting everything in in the same place, having having more attention to the reliability because there's only one solution, and manage the future hardware and software developments so that we can protect ourselves against multiple recurrent costs at, for example, migrating each new system each time there's new technology. So once the decision was made, 
we, you know, sat down and did a project plan and there's a lot of front end data gathering, um, a lot of collaboration with the, the other departments and workflows involved. And it was probably um, from the time we started the project plan and discovering the, visiting the different departments and till about six months to go live from that time frame, which was was pretty aggressive looking back now. We also, in that, we phased it. So we said, you know, when we when we bring the VNA up, you know, we're not going to bring it up with all these departments. So we decided, we went through the planning phase and the discovery of each department. We decided, you know, we would start with these two departments, radiology and cardiology, because their front-end workflow was the least impacted. So it was more of a as-is type of model. So we brought the V&A up, and it was really seamless to them because their workflow on the front-end did not change. We're proceeding now. We went live December 1st, and so now we're working towards bringing up ophthalmology and dermatology, but there is some front-end workflow that and wound care that will they will be impacted. So that's a bigger effort as far as training and the users. That's where we're at with, with that. And that was our progression, you know, through the project. So planning, hardware in place, and then configuration, you know, workflow, discovery. And then so you looked at, we looked at the current workflow, and then we, we did a proposed future workflow for each department and met with each department getting a lot of stakeholders involved. So it's, it's very interesting because you, you learn about areas that you don't, you know, have that expertise in, like we haven't, you know, because we're not as familiar with their workflow. So what this enables, to be clear, and is that before we can, if we've uh, gone to a new facility, before we can convert that PAC system, we can already start uh, archiving into this so that when we convert, we have uh, less migration path to complete, and so we can be more efficient when we're ready to turn on, convert from the old to the new PAC system. Making sure that we're represented at all phases are your different constituents, be that um, uh, different end users. We've, we've talked about the, the interpreting physician in a particular image specialty may be completely different than the consuming physician or the referring physician let alone non-physician clinicians who also have reason to look at this. And I think ever and more importantly is making sure you're set up well for patient engagement. So it takes the ADT and HL7 order and results messages, and they feed the connectivity hub, which is essentially like your centralized database, if you will. So like at Alaria, we have um, Sorian clinicals where they register their patients. At Parma, they use Meditech to register and schedule their patients. So we have interfaces in. So when a patient, so let's say a doctor logs into the, the Meditech system and he orders a cardiology exam, that order gets scheduled. And so the order message goes to the connectivity hub, the patient at some point gets registered. That's the ADT information. This enterprise image management system enables us to be able to share any type of image with other locations with the being connected via um, whichever vendor we select for our image sharing platform. So there's lots of different disparate processes. So this really centralizes the process for us too. I think it's gone really well. Uh, there's no project at this scale that hasn't had um, some issues, so we had some initial delays in retrievability of one type of image. Uh, beyond that, we've certainly hit our targets for the, the, the largest groups of images, which is radiology and cardiology. We have image enabled all 17 of our freestanding hospitals across more than 11 counties, they're all image-enabled. Every place we give care, whether that's the emergency room, a floor, or an ICU, wherever we have our EMRs, they're image-enabled. And so that also includes every satellite facility where we see outpatient uh, visits and provide care. 
It also includes every office, be that a small single physician practice to our larger 15 to 20 physicians who are renting space in a different building than ours. All of them are image enabled. We also have image enabled what we term our physician portal, which lets not only our uh, thousands of physicians see the images, but it also enables uh, independent physicians who take care of our patients and refer in for various image-based testing to see those images as well through a physician portal. And then finally, the layer we're currently working on is to image enable uh, potentially in the future of the patient portal so patients can actually see their images. The advantage to the physician is for the consuming physician to have a unified approach to seeing images, whether they're coming in through a portal or an EMR, that regardless of the type of image it is, they would go through the same icon, the same user interface when they're looking at images, and then select appropriately the type of image for that patient so they're not learning different ways. Secondly, for the physician, it increases the likelihood that we will have a reliable solution that's up instead of intermittently serviced or unexpectedly broken because single paths are easier to support. And I think for the uh, physician who represents the generation of the images, it also lets them work in their niche interpretive system but have much more reliable uh, access to old studies in a consistent performance-enabled rapid solution because we can maintain it more smoothly. And when they're trying to compare with other images, not exactly in their space, that they're enabled to do that. So I think there's three levels of physician improvement through this process. Some of the more easily attainable cost savings are reducing redundant archiving hardware so you have a single archive instead of multiple. I think there's cost savings in terms of being migration prepared and at times migration independent. You've already stored things in a way that you don't have to migrate if something's upgraded or we change a particular front-end vendor. And then I think there's cost savings as well in terms of staffing costs to maintain these things. And as we simplify the map, something we we should always consider is when is the right time to elevate those to cloud-based services where we can have uh, even more cost savings because there's greater economy of scale, obviously within the constraints of uh, safety and privacy. But uh, there is there is scalability at that level that becomes enabled once you've pooled everything in a, into a single position. So we have the potential to consolidate workforce so that they only have to own and manage a single solution. Uh, it consolidates uh, relationships so that you only have to have uh, so many uh, vendor solutions to the same problem. Um, it consolidates communications. Uh, it consolidates our connections, which is also equally important. And so it consolidates the maps of what we have to put in place and maintain. The benefit of having this enterprise image management system is we don't have to do a migration from our current PAC system into the new PAC system, which is a huge effort, and it's, it's a huge cost to migrate images. That's the other benefit. So you would just take that top layer out, take that current PACS application out, put in your other your new PACS application on top, and your enterprise image management already knows where everything resides, so you don't have to migrate anything from one application to the other. Defining, as we do in any major project, making sure there's clear definition of uh, the requirements and the priorities, as well as uh, best definition of uh, success. I think having a long view is important. Not only should this enable you to do well today and have short-term success, but if you, uh, one would hope this would enable the future as well, diminish the carrying cost and the, and the migrations uh, necessary in later years. As we further enable uh, the enterprise image management, say put in the next ology, that the day we turn that on one place, we've turned it on every place. And you, you can't do that if you have multiple small things you're trying to manage. So I think this just continues the journey to more reliable 
access to previous information based on patient-centered information. And even when the patient can't call correctly or what happened, you can readily look it up. I think those are important uh, successes from enterprise-wide management. Well, thanks so much for joining us for the live question and answer portion of this webinar. I am Mary Tierney, the Chief Content Officer of Health Imaging and TriMed Media Group, and I am lucky enough to be the moderator here today. If you would like to ask a question, please just type it into the Ask a Question box on your console and hit Submit, and we'll get to as many questions as we can in the next 15 minutes or so. On the line live with us today, who you just heard from, from University Hospitals, we have both Dr. Jeff Sunshine and Beverly Recipko as well as Anders Olsterholm, who is the Vice President of Sales Operation at Sectra, who can handle any kind of technological um, specific questions that, that may come in as well. So thank you so much for joining you guys. I really appreciate it. We have some questions that have already started to come in, so let's get started. Jeff, I'm wondering if perhaps you could take our first question. Can you detail for me which departments are currently live on your VNA and which ones you are planning to connect in the future? Certainly. Uh, hello, everybody, and thanks uh, for your engagement. We have the core of radiology and cardiology, which are together the majority of our imaging volume in the health system. Uh, we are working toward uh, ophthalmology next, and we are considering after that other, as we like to say, ologies such as dermatology or gastroenterology. But the uh, the two biggest Providers of imaging are already live, radiology and cardiology. In the same kind of, in the same kind of vein, maybe um, you could continue on this topic as well. And Beverly, you can per certainly feel free to chime in as well. For future, for future workflow outside of radiology and cardiology, are you going to implement an ordering system of some type? Well, ordering systems that we envision are a core EMR focused, so that is our intended source of orders. Uh, and mm -hmm. first is those that are supported directly within the health system. Uh, I think a, a broader challenge in the future may be how to capture orders from independent sources, working on independent EMRs and that degree of interoperability, if that's behind the question, would be um, sort of future design not yet crafted. Okay. Maybe, Beverly, we could um, get you involved in this in this next question. It, it kind of um, does dovetail on the beginning questions of, of which departments you guys have kind of connected. But um, in the process, how many image-generating departments have you identified? At least six, um, but that doesn't account for all the independent. What we've identified um, was independent machines that sit in the ICU, um, ultrasounds, sitting a physician's office, those we're still uncovering as we go. Okay. Okay. Let's see. I guess maybe Beverly, maybe even um, Anders, maybe you can, can chime in this, on this as well. You mentioned that you've been growing. Can you tell us about the process of bringing new facilities onto the VNA and how simple or difficult that can be to accomplish? So, Beverly, maybe you could start us out? Sure. I could start with that. So, it, it has become... A a ritual for us, a routine, as we've expanded over the last couple of years. It um, honestly, as we've progressed, it, it becomes easier. The the tools that are in the the VNA accommodate the ability to pull the to query retrieve the data into the VNA. One thing that um, was a challenge, and, and it's a decision per organization, if you want to import the prior order and reports for those images, then um, you can work with the vendor, the originating vendor, and get a flat file of those. And we found that useful for, for certain data, so something to consider as you're importing. One challenge that we um, did identify as far as um, sometimes the the hardware of the legacy systems can be a challenge to be able to make the process speedy, but that's a limitation that we can't really, you know, get around. So overall, though, I, I feel like it's been a smooth process once we got one under our belt 
working through the different, and now it's essentially a, we have a cookie cutter, for the most part, obviously different systems, you know, there, there comes different things, factors into play, but overall it has been um, easier as we go. Um, and does maybe, I mean, you have obviously wider experience as well with multiple customers. Do you want to talk a little bit about bringing, you know, the, the growth factor and bringing new facilities into the, onto the VNA? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, so one of the first steps is to take a look at a, a facilities or a, or a department's current workflow and identify their precise needs. Be it, you know, are they DICOM ready today? Is it something where they can suffice by uh, rendering into DICOM various image type objects, or whether they need to get the data back in its uh, original format? And through that, then do Know, a present and future workflow for the departments, because many outside of radiology and cardiology don't necessarily have that digital thought process uh, in how they ingest information. But once, as, as Beverly alluded to, once you have done this a few times, uh, you, you kind of start settling in on here's the, here's the process, here's our best practices, and you go down a checklist of identifying the needs and how you modify the workflow uh, in the day-to-day -day work, as, as well as how, uh, of course, those departments start accessing the information in a more consolidated fashion, preferably through directly through the EMR. Great. Okay, Beverly, we have we have a lot of questions that have come in, so this is this is great. Beverly, I'm wondering if maybe you can take this one. Is the solution you implemented a series of different products from the same vendor, or the entire solution in a single software code stream? We're wrestling with a deconstructed approach or a converged approach. What is your opinion? We've implemented the Sectra DNA, and along with that, it is part of the product, but it is a separate component. Is the connectivity hub. So that's the sing our single solution and for our um, – we do also have a sector of PACs, but we've had that in place for many years. So I think, I think that addresses the question. I think so as well. And Jeff, I'm wondering if perhaps you can take our next question that says, how did the departments all react to the suggestion of a VNA? Were there groups that were resistant and why? When it was proposed to the various departments, what was the reaction? So, so kudos for the question. I think in our case, we were able to demonstrate that there was at least the potential, if not factual ability to deliver improved performance from the back end archives supported from the VNA to deliver better clinical uh, utilization to the front end consumer, and at the same time to enable wider distribution of what is otherwise somewhat siloed information. Uh, and those two things help us convert the, or explain really to the department why this is in their best interest. Um, there are at times the potential for cost burdens, which uh, centrally we own, and, and it's better though that I think there's functional benefit for them. And I think if I use two departments as an example, cardiology, where we're able to take advantage once we're in a centralized uh, image archive VNA environment with dis distribution of those cardiology imaging, not just to the cardiologist, but the clinicians at large connected through links in the EMRs, that's better client relations for themselves, and they widely appreciated that. Um, whereas if you're trying to talk about uh, some specialty images, let's say, within ophthalmology that only an ophthalmologist would ex be expected to ever want to look at, then there's less benefit perhaps to all clinician access. But I think it's, it's a discussion. We have not faced resistance at this point from the department so long as we could um, express that we were going to deliver as good or better service and price points. Great. Okay. This is the next topic. I wonder, maybe Beverly or Anders, you could you could talk about this. Um, I know this has been a, a topic of discussion um, and a little bit of controversy, I guess, over time. But I guess I'm curious to know if, if you have have a solution for it. Do you have a solution for deleting images that are no longer necessary due to the age of the image? So I guess the question is this: Are you deleting images? So Beverly, is that something you guys are doing? 
Or you just no, it, it is not something we have done yet, but with, okay. the, with the implementation of this product, um, that is a function that is something that we are going to be doing soon. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Anders, what is what is your experience um, across your customer base? So when it comes to uh, yeah, deleting historical uh, or, or uh, older images, the key to it is to fine tune and and, and uh, figure out exactly what the rules and regulations are in terms of what you have to keep. And in many cases, the hospitals actually end up keeping uh, a whole lot more than maybe they need to, cause it, just because it's better to be safe than than sorry if you delete something that you weren't supposed to delete just yet. But of course, part of the, the upside with the DNA is that now you have all the images in one location and you can start addressing that more across the board and uh, get those older studies out of the system that you no longer need or you're no longer required to, uh, to keep uh, with the, you know, the benefits of recouping the storage space and or managing, of course, the risk uh, that comes with keeping, uh, keeping older uh, information still on, on board. Of course. So it's a mixed bag. I mean, m many end up keeping a lot of the data a lot longer than they probably need to. Yeah, I think <laughs> I think that's what I've most most commonly heard as well. So that makes sense. Beverly, maybe you could take our next question that says, "How do you handle synchronization of the images between the acquisition system and the the archives?" So between what is in the acquisition system and the archives, they would make sure that the data is accurate. So part of our process is to validate the data in in this case. So like from, if it's not accurate in Singo, then it won't go to the archive because there's a step, and that's our cardiology system, um, that it does not send to the archive. If something, and we have lists that we monitor in the VNA, so if something was missing risk, if you will, or, or missing order information, it gets flagged, and it goes to a work list, and we would then correct the data on the acquisition system or originating, like if it's a Singo application or a PAX application, correct it there and then re-archive it to the VNA. Great. A lot of other questions, but, but specifically, can you maybe... Um, Beverly, maybe even Andrews too. Can you specifically describe how the connectivity hub works? I mean, you mentioned linking patient images via the database, but can you can you talk a little bit more about that in detail? Sure, I can give my version, and then Andrews can add to it a more technical explanation if he'd like. So, um, in our environment here at University Hospitals, we have the connectivity hub, and we have six different risk systems sending ADT orders results and our EMRs sending ADT orders into the connectivity hub. We have different multiple or we have different MRNs for different um, locations that we have acquired for different hospitals over the last couple of years. So the connectivity hub, one of its functions is called patient linking. And with the patient linking, there's an algorithm that runs on that connectivity hub and based on like date of birth, name, and social security number might be the first level of the algorithm, and it will match the patients or link the patients, not in the back end, but to the, in the front end to the front end user. And there's a lot of different configuration, the way that you can have things viewed. So if I'm Dr. Sunshine and I log in to read my exams, when he logs in and he selects a patient, he then he only has to see that patient one time, and then he has all the comparisons available to him. So previously, if I had images from three different MRNs, I'd have that patient listed three different times, and it would be very difficult in a manual process to merge those exams and even know that they're there. So that's one function of the Connectivity Hub. There's other functionality. That's, I think that's where they do their lifecycle management, prefetching, and there's additional things coming down the um, the road, but I do know that the connect the connectivity hub, as far as patient linking, has been huge, huge success here for us to be able to provide our patients the care that they need and make sure that we're getting the comparisons. So that's my explanation of the connectivity hub. 
Anderson? Yeah, I mean, yes, to, to add to that, I mean, it, it's basically a, um, a workhorse for messaging and a tool to automate certain tasks. So based on messages coming in from various HL7 sources, for instance, you can accomplish what Beverly subscribed there as a dynamic EMPI, if you will. Uh, but it can also uh, trigger other tasks, such as go out and search for priors, bring them over to the VNA, in, including also, for instance, routing on or sending images out for sharing, critical results reporting, various tasks that, uh, based on triggers from incoming messages, someone in the past might have had to do manually. Now this box can automate that and have it flow nicer uh, as well as when it comes to distributing results. If you have report messages that needs to go to multiple locations or have medical record numbers changed on the fly as they go out, it can do that also. So it becomes a you know, critical component in, in the messaging in and out. Thank you. Um, just a couple more questions. I know and, um, we don't want to go too long on everyone's time today. Jeff, I'm wondering if you could take this next question, which talks about patient portals. Um, I know what is what is your goal for patient portals, and how are you rolling those out? Well, that's a great question, though, not directly at this point linked to VNA strategy. Uh, I, I think okay. they may come together. Uh, our, v, our, our patient portal strategy is uh, to be unified, to have a single provider. We use a tool called Follow My Health. We have not image enabled that yet. Um, we're trying to figure out not so much the technical how, but the what to do there. In the interim, we're working to far better enable the exchange of image data point to point between providers so that we don't have to burn or receive burned CDs and DVDs through uh, the community exchange that we were just referring to. So it's, it's layered. First, I think we'd like to attack uh, just the exchange of information necessary for continuity of medical care, and then secondarily look at uh, enabling a portal for, for viewing. Okay. I mean, just a couple of, of closers, I guess, really kind of looking, um, you know, words from the wise, I guess. And I guess maybe Jeff or Beverly, I'm not even, maybe everyone can answer this one, but what do you know now that you didn't know before you deployed a VNA that you would pass on to others? Maybe Jeff, you could start. I think it's, a, as always, uh, there's more steps in the process than we initially envision. I think we've actually been successful quicker in some ways than we expected, uh, I would say, especially in our delivery of cardiology. But every step along the way has its wrinkles, and we've been able to work through them. You know, getting a particular image link to work with a particular EMR is just a line on a, on a project uh, management path, but sometimes it works overnight, and sometimes it takes a couple of weeks and has some consequences until you uh, get all the wrinkles smoothed out. So those kinds of usual discoveries. But I would say it's in some ways the initial phase has been faster than expected. Good. Beverly, do you have some comments to add to that? Sure. I, w I would just say, you know, going into it and, and you think it's a VNA vendor neutral archive, but really the power of it, and I like to refer to it as an EMR for images, because it does give you that one patient, one record that you want for images, and then the, the power of connecting that to your EMR. I think it's been, we knew it was going to be beneficial, we knew there was benefits, but to me, now that we're implemented it to where we're at, you know, just seeing the future is, um, and just continuing to build that one patient, one record for our organization from the EMR and image enabling so many different systems and being able to streamline those where before you might have had four different links to be able to view images from various systems with different viewers. It just has been exciting from my perspective to see the, the true power of it and the benefits of it for the organizations, but especially for the patients and the clinicians. Great. Anders, do you want to add anything from more of a, um, an overarching perspective, I guess? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, so this all comes down to, of course, making the patient record more complete and include imaging. And as you overcome some of the perhaps initial obstacles that it has in play when you bring uh, departments over to being digital, 
once the front end consumers start seeing all this information, they tend to come back and say, you know, say, that was great. Can I have some more? And that continues then to drive how you can bring images in, complete the, uh, the medical record with everything else that's in your EMR. Great. Um, well, uh, we're going to stop here. Um, I want to thank everyone so much for joining us today. A special thank you to Beverly and Dr. Jeff Sunshine and Anders for your great answers today. Thank you, everyone, for submitting your questions as well. And this has really been a great, great session. I know I've learned a lot. If you missed any part of this webinar or would like to listen to it again, even forward along to a colleague, um, you will be emailed a link over the next couple of days to the on-demand event that can be shared around. Thank you so much for joining us and have a great day.